We can stop HIV, Iowa. Unfortunately, there are barriers that make our job a little more difficult. Stigma is one of our biggest challenges. So we should talk about HIV more. And support people living with HIV. Visit StopHIVIowa.org. This is Space Time Series 21, Episode 74, for broadcast on the 19th of September 2018. Coming up on Space Time, how asteroid impacts shaped Earth's ancient geology. Astronomers witnessed the birth of a new star from a stellar explosion. And did Earth's water come from dust? All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study has found that some of the oldest rocks on the planet are the result of asteroids slamming to the primordial Earth, causing its rocks to melt. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Geoscience, show that Earth's oldest evolved or granitic rocks, which form part of the Acastogenes complex in northwest Canada, have compositions that are quite distinct from those typical of Earth's ancient continental crust. And these differences suggest that they form through a very different process. The study's lead author, Dr. Tim Johnson from Curtin University, says the melting of these rocks at such shallow levels is most easily explained by meteorite impacts, which would have supplied the energy to attain the extreme temperatures required for melting. The authors used computer modelling to show that the rocks were produced by the partial melting of iron-rich hydrated basaltic rocks at very low pressures, equivalent to the uppermost few kilometres of the crust. The simulations of asteroid impact show that not only is this scenario physically plausible, but the region of shallow partial melting needed to form these ancient evolved rocks would have been widespread. Given the predicted high flux of meteorites which bombarded the Earth around 4 billion years ago, impact melting may well have been the predominant mechanism that generated granitic rocks at that time. Earth's Hadean and earliest Archean eons between 4.5 and 3.9 billion years ago were dominated by a barrage of asteroid impacts known as the Late Heavy Bombardment, which would have caused widespread melting and recycling of the planet's surface. Consequently, there are almost no rocks preserved from Earth's formative Hadean eon. The only known evolved rocks from the Hadean are those in northwestern Canada, and they have chemical compositions clearly distinct from those which dominate ancient continental crusts worldwide. And that, says Tim Johnson, suggests that they formed in a different way. The research really stemmed from me looking at some existing data. And these evolved rocks or granitic rocks in, in the Acastanice province in, in northwest Canada just have chemical compositions that look just slightly odd. They're different from the granitic rocks that make up most of our ancient continent. And it just got me thinking about what their petrogenesis was, what formed them. So I did some uh, modelling to try and work out what minerals might have been present at various conditions within these rocks, basically as a function of their, their temperature and their pressure or their depth. And it turns out that the rocks, according to our calculations, could only have formed at very high temperatures, but at very low pressure, so at very shallow levels in the crust. And the only way of getting rocks at up to such high temperatures where they started to melt at such shallow levels, really, is by impact. So you need to put tremendous amounts of energy into the uppermost bits of the planet, and impact seemed a, the only plausible way to me of doing that. I take it that means that the heat of impact is, is much greater than, say, what you'd normally see with volcanic lava floating on the surface of the Earth. Oh, well, not necessarily, but, the, but the, the granites that we see that make up the vast majority of our continents of course, um, because the llamas would be more basalts, wouldn't they? Exactly. So, so we're talking about these pale-coloured, felsic, granitic rocks. The vast majority of those in the continents we know were formed at depths of 20, 30 or 40 kilometres in the crust, where um, they were stable with a mineral called garnet. And that, that imparts a particular trace element signature, a fingerprint on the chemistry of the rocks. And that fingerprint is absent from these most ancient rocks. And the calculations suggest that rather than 20, 30, 40 kilometres depth, they probably formed in the uppermost three kilometres. So geologically speaking, that's very, very shallow. And as I said, to get, to get these rocks up to such high temperatures at such, such shallow depths, impacts is the only really 
plausible mechanism of supplying that heat. And you've described these as possibly the oldest known evolved rocks on Earth. Firstly, I guess I need to find out what he's meant by evolved as opposed to any other type of rock. So the rocks that make up the scum of the Earth, the crust that we all live on, are subdivided really into two types. Very dark rocks, which are the basalts that you talked about earlier, and they're formed from the direct melting, the partial melting of the mantle, which is the, la the layer underneath the crust. And the other type of crustal rocks we find are pale coloured rocks or felsic rocks or granitic rocks, if you like. And that's what we mean by evolved. And granitic rocks in their most primitive form were formed from partial melting of, of basalts. And then you can reprocess those, remelt them to form even more evolved compositions, uh, which are the sorts of things that hold the mineral deposits that we all hold so dear and are so important to our um, economy. But by evolved, we really just mean pale coloured granitic rocks. In this case, you're also able to date them, what that turned out to show. These were dated in the 1980s by a guy called Sam Bowring uh, in the US. And he used a very common method, which is the uranium lead zircon method. So he separated tiny little grains of uh, the mineral zircon, which are very abundant in these evolved granitic rocks. Um, and you can then, via a very careful um, and fiddly um, process, you can dissolve those in certain very, very clean acids. And then you can measure the relative proportion of certain isotopes of um, uranium and in particular lead. And based on um, the proportion of those isotopes, you can give the, the rock a crystallization age, an age in which it's solidified, basically. And the age of those rocks is 4.02 or 4.03 billion years. So this works on the same principle as, as carbon dating, where you have certain unstable radioactive isotopes of an element like carbon-14. And over time, because they're unstable, they break down to form a more stable form of carbon or even another element. And by measuring the proportion of those things, um, you can uh, work out the age of, of rocks or archaeological artifacts or whatever you like. Yeah, we know the Earth's uh, around 4.6 billion years old, and uh, these rocks aren't as old as the planet itself, but they're not far off it. I guess there's always that problem trying to find the oldest rocks on Earth because the Earth is such a good recycler of stuff. That's absolutely true. So these are the only rocks we know of which are older than 4 billion years. So that's the eon in Earth history called the Hadean, which is named after Hades, the Greek god of the underworld, and it means hidden, basically. The name derives from the word hidden. And we know almost nothing about the Hadean for exactly that reason. Most of the evidence has been hidden from us. Now, I'm sure there are other small remnants of rocks that are older, and certainly there are these basaltic rocks which must be older than these, these granitic rocks, but those basaltic rocks generally don't contain any zircon, so we have no means of directly dating them. But of course, we do have lots of these tiny grains of the mineral zircon, which the oldest of those goes back to 4.4 billion years old, but because they're isolated grains that we find in later sandstones and and sedimentary rocks, the context in which those grains were formed is lost to us. So we have to go through and measure various chemical aspects of those grains and try and, to, try and make some inferences about how the rocks that they came from might have formed originally. And they're the ones we find at places like Jack Hills. That's exactly right, yeah. Jack Hills is the most famous and the oldest repository of these ancient zircons we have. But as we keep looking, people are finding Hadean grains, so these older than 4 billion year old grains, in all sorts of, uh, of places within the ancient continental cores. What is it about zircons that makes them such good time capsules? Well, a few things. One is that they're very physically and chemically robust. So once they formed, it's very difficult to destroy them, either by dissolving them in, in various melts or fluids. And because they're very, very hard, it's difficult to, to break them down and turn them into dust, basically. So they're very long lived. But the other actual real key feature is that they can... They like some uranium in their structure, so they like sucking up some uranium, but they don't like to have lead in their structure. So because they only start with uranium, then the clock starts kick ticking when they crystallize, and then they just produce um, lead via a rather complex 
series of disequilibria breakdown. But anyway, whereas other minerals that we use for dating can also incorporate some lead. So it's a, it's a slightly technical answer, but uranium starts with a nice clean clock that we can then measure. With zircons, what happens is they'll form in the molten magma ocean and crystallize there. And once they've done that, they don't melt again. They, they stay in their crystallized form pretty well, even if they wind up in more magma later on. Is that right? That's right. That's right. So, so zircon is mainly a combination of zirconium oxide and silica, silicon oxide, silica. Um, so that, that's why they only really grow in these evolved rocks, in these granitic rocks. So when you have the basaltic rocks, the dark rocks that we find, there's not enough silica in those to, to grow the zircon. So that's why whenever we're looking to date things, we look for these pale coloured granitic rocks because that's our best chance of finding some nice fresh zircon that we can subsequently date. I think the importance of this study really is that this is perhaps the strongest evidence that the Earth was, for its first 600 million years, bombarded by this barrage of asteroids. We know just from looking at the moon, and we know the age of huge impacts on the moon, which were about 3.8, 3.9 billion years, that the our part of the solar system suffered this barrage, but finding direct evidence of it on Earth, for exactly the reasons you stated earlier, is, is difficult because plate tectonics is a very efficient way of recycling the surface. And I think this study, if anything, provides pretty firm evidence of this barrage of asteroid impacts in its early history, Earth's early history. So that could be both a collaboration of the Nice model of planetary migration and also the late heavy bombardment. Exactly so, yes. I, I I don't have uh, any particular horses in those races, but um, uh, I, I certainly think it's compelling evidence that the Earth at around 4 billion years was still being hit by lots of large asteroids. That's Dr. Tim Johnson from Curtin University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have been granted a unique insight into the dramatic death of a star. The cataclysmic explosive death of massive stars in supernovae can be bright enough to outshine their host galaxies. They usually fade away over the following months and years. But sometimes, the gaseous remains of the explosion collide with hydrogen-rich gas, previously pumped out into the surrounding interstellar medium by the doomed star, causing the supernova to brighten again. However, Assistant Professor Dan Milisalevic from Purdue University says Supernova 2012AU appears to have remained luminous six years after the initial explosion, without slamming into any outside gas. Discovered back in March 2012, SN 2012AU is a Type 1b core collapse supernova, which exploded about 1800 light years from the centre of the NGC 1790 star cluster in the constellation Virgo. Reporting in the Astrophysical Journal Letters, Mili Salevik and colleagues weren't able to detect any hydrogen signatures in the brightening. He says he's never seen a supernova explosion quite like this one before, at such a late timescale and remaining visible unless it's had some kind of interaction with hydrogen gas left behind by the star prior to the explosion. So, something else must be energising the later stages of the supernova activity. As high-mass stars go supernova, their interiors collapse inwards with such tremendous pressure and energy, it forces their positively charged protons and negatively charged electrons to literally be crushed together, forming neutrons. If the resulting neutron star has a magnetic field and is rotating fast enough, then it may develop into a pulsar wind nebula. And Milsalevic believes this is what most likely happened to SN2012 AU. While well, scientists have long known that supernova explosions produce rapidly rotating neutron stars, they've never before seen direct evidence of it occurring over such a unique time frame. That's because this is a key moment when the pulsar wind nebula is bright enough to act as a sort of light bulb illuminating the explosion's outer ejector. SN2012 AU was already known to be extraordinary and weird in many ways. Although the explosion wasn't bright enough to be termed a superluminous supernova, it nevertheless was extremely energetic and long-lasting, and it dimmed in a similarly slow light curve. Milsalevic predicts that if researchers continue to monitor the sites of extremely bright supernovae, they may well see similar transformations. 
And if it turns out there is a newly born pulsar or magneto wind nebula at the centre of the newly exploded star, it could push from the inside out, accelerating the gas. Mulsalevic suggests returning to the supernova in a few years' time and taking further measurements to see how it's evolving. He predicts the possibility of observing the oxygen-rich gas racing away from the explosion at even greater velocity. Milsalevic describes the event as a golden link between superluminous supernovae and their lower luminosity counterparts. Superluminous supernovae are a hot topic in transient astronomy. That's because they're potential sources for both gravitational waves and black holes, and astronomers think they may be related to other kinds of explosions, like gamma-ray bursts and fast radio bursts. So researchers want to understand the fundamental physics behind them. Trouble is, they're difficult to observe because they're relatively rare and because they usually happen far away from Earth. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. A new study has suggested that water trapped in the dust grains from which the Earth formed could explain how our planet got its water. The conclusions reported in the Journal of Astronomy and Astrophysics are based on new calculations and simulations. For a long time now, scientists have been struggling with an explanation for the large amounts of water found on Earth. You see, Earth, like all planets, formed through a hot accretion process as more and more rocks slammed together creating the planet. But the planet didn't form cold, it would have formed as a hot magma ocean. And that environment would have been further amplified by the virtually coup de grace collision between Earth and a Mars-sized object about 4.5 billion years ago, which eventually formed our Moon. All that heat meant that any water which may have formed with the planet would most likely have evaporated back into space. And that leaves the question, where did Earth get its water from? The most popular previous hypotheses have all suggested that the water was delivered either by comets or asteroids that slammed into the Earth after its initial formation. But when they checked the hydrogen to deuterium ratio in water found in comets, it was different to that found on Earth. But there was another idea which suggested that the Earth was born wet, with the water already present in giant boulders which clumped together to form the planet in the first place. The problem is the amount of water present in these large boulders would be somewhat limited. But now, scientists have developed a variant on the boulder with water scenario. The authors have shown that in the region of space where Earth originated, small up to say millimetre sized dust grains could hold lots of water. And these water rich dust grains would then clump together to form pebbles and eventually the kilometre sized boulders the proto Earth was composed of. So, based on that scenario, these boulders can then contain enough water and they eventually go on to form the Earth with all the water that's here today. The new calculations also show that the small dust grains would collect enough water in only a million years or so to explain the amount of water found on Earth today. And by a nice coincidence, a million years roughly fits in quite nicely with the amount of time it takes to form the larger boulders. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. After a career spanning some 30 years, the last ever Delta II rocket is blasted into orbit, carrying a new billion-dollar NASA satellite to study climate change. The Ice, Cloud and Land Elevation Satellite 2, or ISAT-2, blasted off into pre-dawn skies from Space Launch Complex 2W at the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The final launch of the Delta II lifting ISAT-2 into space this morning. LC launch enable the flight. Flight. ATC-3, main power disable on. On. Hydraulics are go. Status check. Go Delta II. Go oh, ISAT-2. 15. Top and go. 14. Green board. 13, There's 12, that green board call. 11, that is great. 10. 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Liftoff of the final Delta II, launching nearly three decades of science research and exploration missions, lifting ISAT 2 on a quest to explore the polar ice sheets of our constantly changing home planet. 30 seconds in, Mach 1, Delta 2 is now supersonic. 
continuing to see good chamber pressure on the RS-27, both veneer engines as well, uh, seeing consistent uh, fuel and oxidizer injector pressures as well. And at T plus 46 seconds, max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. 57 seconds in, we have wet burnout on the uh, solid rocket motors, seeing good responses, and we have burnout on all four motors. To and Delta will hold on to those motors for an additional 20 seconds prior to jettison. Now one minute, 20 seconds in, standing by for motor jettison. And we have good indication indication of jettison of all four solid rocket motors. Continuing to see good chamber pressure on the RS-27, good chamber pressures on both veneer engines as well. Stable pressures on the uh, fuel and oxidizer injector pressures. Vehicle body rates uh, looking stable. And the booster bi-level charge is fired to maintain necessary ullage pressure in the booster. LOX tank ullage pressure response looks good. Two minutes, 25 seconds in, the booster is now beginning powered flight guidance. Body rate response looks good. And at two minutes, 45 seconds into flight, continuing to see good performance on the RS-27 main engine and uh, good chamber pressures on both veneer engines as well. Vehicle body rates remain very stable. Now passing three minutes into flight. Continuing to see good all-edge pressures on the uh, fuel and oxidizer tanks, good uh, fuel and oxidizer inlet pressures as well. RS-27 continuing to perform well, stable chamber pressure and fuel and oxidizer injector pressures, and seeing good stable pressures on both veneer engines. Now passing four minutes into flight, approximately 20 seconds remaining until engine cutoff. And booster has stopped active guidance in preparation for MECO. Standing by for engine cutoff. And we have cutoff of the RS-27. Veneer engines continuing to burn as expected. Standing by for veneer engine cutoff. And we have good veneer engine cutoff. And now four minutes, 45 seconds into flight. We've seen good separation of stage one and two and good ignition on the second stage. Four minutes, 55 seconds into flight. Chamber pressure on the AJ-10 looks good. Body rate's looking good. And we have good indication of fairing jettison. And this first burn of today's mission will last approximately 6 minutes, 15 seconds. Second stage engine continuing to perform well. Chamber pressure looks good. Seeing good uh, stable hydraulic system pressure. Fuel and oxidizer feed line pressure is also looking very good. And uh, vehicle body rates looking very stable. And 5 minutes remaining in the burn. Now passing 6 minutes, 30 seconds into flight. Uh, continuing this first burn of the second stage. Engine performance continues to look good, seeing stable feed line pressures on both fuel and oxidizer systems and uh, good chamber pressure. And now passing 7 minutes, 35 seconds into flight, seeing a uh, minor telemetry dropout, but uh, telemetry has resumed and continue to see good performance on the AJ-10 engine, good feed line pressures on fuel and oxidizer systems, good hydraulic system pressure, battery currents and voltages all remaining very stable throughout this first burn, and uh, body rates on the second stage remaining very stable as well. And at 8 minutes, 54 seconds into flight, now approximately 2 minutes remaining in the first burn of the second stage. Continuing to see very good performance on the second stage engine. Very stable fuel and oxidizer feed line pressures, hydraulic system pressure. Helium bottle pressure uh, decay profile appears to be within family. Approximately 1 minute remaining until SECO 1. Now passing 10 minutes, 20 seconds into flight. Seeing a slight decay in the uh, thrust chamber pressure and fuel and oxidizer feed line pressures uh, as to be expected for the uh, later portion of the first burn. And standing by for engine cut off and now passing 11 minutes into flight and we have seco second stage engine cutoff body rates uh, damping out well after the uh, transients from the shutdown event isat 2 was deployed into a 496 kilometer high near polar orbit from where it'll measure ice sheet elevation and sea ice thickness as well as global land topography and vegetation characteristics the 1,514 kg spacecraft is equipped with an advanced topographic laser altimeter system or ATLAS, basically a space-based LIDAR bouncing photon pulses off the Earth's surface in order to measure changes in ice. It's designed to operate for three years, but carries enough propellant to last for up to seven. The mission marked the 100th successful launch of the United Launch Alliance Delta II rocket, the former American space industry workhorse. And of course it was the 155th and final launch of the Delta II, which began life as the McDonnell Douglas Delta II in the wake of the 1986 Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. You see, following Challenger, the White House ordered the Space Shuttle no longer carry commercial satellite payloads, a very function it was built for, and that forced both government agencies and private companies to move to expendable launch vehicles, with the Delta II launching its first payload a GPS satellite for the US Air Force, in 1989. Since then, Delta IIs have launched a huge array of military, scientific and commercial satellites, including more than 50 for the US Space Agency, to the Moon, Mars and beyond. For its final mission, the Delta II flew in its 74-2010 configuration, equipped with four strap-on solid rocket motors and a three-metre diameter payload fairing. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time.
China has launched two more Badoo navigation satellites as part of its growing global network. The Badoo or Compass 3M11 and 3M12 blasted into orbit aboard a Long March 3B rocket from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in Sichuan Province. The 1014 kilogram satellites, which are also known as the Badoo 35 and Badoo 36, were successfully placed into medium Earth orbits at altitudes of between 21,400 and 21,500 kilometres. Three more pairs of Badoo satellites are slated for launch before the end of the year. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study shows that the strongest tropical cyclones and storms, like the deadly Hurricane Florence and Super Typhoon Mancook, are getting stronger due to climate change. Dr Sophie Lewis from the ARC Centre of Excellence for Climate Extremes at the University of New South Wales says most of the damage caused by these storms isn't directly caused by high winds, but rather from rainfall and storm surge. The study by the Stony Brook University and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory found that Florence was 80 kilometres larger and dumping 50% more rain when it slammed into the Carolina coastline than what it would have had human activity causing climate change not warmed the planet. Meanwhile, Super Typhoon Mancourt, which struck the Philippines and China, grew to be by far the bigger cyclone of 2018. Climate change fuels hurricanes, cyclones and typhoons, they're all really the same thing, by increasing the amount of moisture in the atmosphere and heightening the warmth of the oceans. In fact, several storms that have formed in the Atlantic have intensified to unusual strength in recent years as part of a trend that scientists say is all consistent with planetary warming. A new study warns that people with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, may not be getting the medication they need. The findings, reported in the Lancet Medical Journal, involved over 154 million people. Researchers looked at trends in ADHD medications in 14 countries across Europe, North America, Australia and Asia. They estimated that while ADHD affects between 5 and 7% of children and around 2.5% of adults worldwide, medication used ranged from only around 0.3% in France to 6.7% in the United States. Together with the kangaroo and the platypus, the koala has become an iconic Australian native animal. Sadly, they're also an animal which is threatened with extinction, with a dramatic population decline due to habitat loss, increased predators and roadkill. In fact, their situation is so dire, researchers say the koala's best hope now is that genetic diversity could be their saving grace. Scientists from James Cook University have found two very distinct genetic groups of koala populations across the country. However, their findings, reported in the journal Heredity, also warns that it could be unwise to move the marsupials across these regions due to their adaption to different environments and their strong territorial and home range urges. Meanwhile, experts in another unique Australian marsupial, the wombat, are now gathering for a three-day conference at the University of Adelaide. Because they're nocturnal and live underground, studying wombats can be a real challenge and there's still a great deal scientists need to learn about them. Whilst the southern hairy-nosed wombat and the bare-nosed wombat aren't relatively common, the northern hairy-nosed wombat remains another of Australia's many highly endangered animals. Iran has confirmed that it's completed work on a new facility at its Natanz reactor plant to build additional centrifuges for uranium enrichment. The confirmation comes as the Islamic Republic's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei confirmed that he had ordered the preparations to increase the country's nuclear capacity. Tehran claims the increased nuclear capabilities will assist in the development of nuclear-powered ship reactors. Despite concerns about its nuclear program being directed towards atomic bombs, the all-rich nation insists its nuclear program is for peaceful power generation only. Apple's long-awaited new iPhones have finally been released, and as you'd expect, Apple devotees are going nuts as the release date for sale approaches. With the details, we're joined by Alex Sahar of Reut 
from IT Wire. We've got two brand new iPhones, the 10s and the 10s Max. This is effectively similar to the previous, you know, 8 and 8 Plus or 7 and 7 Plus, but of course we now have the edge-to-edge display except for the notch at the very I top. I hate the notch. Well, I, I don't mind the notch at all. It's sort of invisible. I mean, look, when I'm watching video and I make it full screen, then yes, you know, it's there and you see it. The price of the 10s in Australia, the 64 gig is 1629, the 256 gig is 1879, and the 512 gig model is uh, 2199. <laughs> so that definitely breaks the 2000 dollars barrier. And for the for the Max, you've got the same 64 gig, 256 gig, and 512 gig versions. And we're talking 1799, 2049 and 2369 respectively. Now we also have the iPhone 10R. This is like the smaller 10S, but it's bigger. It's got a 6.1 inch screen as opposed to a 5.8 inch screen, but it's still smaller than the 6.5 inch screen of the Max. It only has one camera though, as opposed to the twin cameras on the 10S and the 10S Max series. So it's a bit more like the, the iPhone 8. Now that one will be 64 gig for 12, 29, much more affordable. 128 gig for 12.99, and then 14.79 for the 256 gig. So clearly not budget; they're all over a thousand dollars. And for those who are not on the Apple side of the fence, well, you've got the Samsung Galaxy Note 9. You've got Huawei's got a new Mate 20 coming out. Google will have its Pixel 3 phones very soon. Uh, Oppo's Find 10 that has no notch at all. But there's plenty of competition out there at all kinds of price points. What are the big features on the new iPhones? Well, you've got a A12 Bionic chip, which faster and better than the previous one by many orders of you know magnitude with next generation new engine, faster face ID, wider stereo sound, and uh, also you've got the dual nano SIMs. So, well, actually, you've got one nano SIM, and in models outside of China, you have a thing called an eSIM. Now, the eSIM is a SIM. It's like the one in the Apple Watch. You can't take it out, but you can program. And so, in theory, you could switch between any different carrier that you want, but a lot of carriers still have to support it. In China, they don't allow that, so the Chinese models will have two SIM slots. What do you think that is? Obviously, it's something to do with the Chinese government wanting control, and that control means that they don't allow eSIMs at the moment. And that report by Alex Sahara of Reut from IT Wire. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast through Apple Podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Times also broadcasts coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 